This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, I'm Chris Morgan. I'm a wildlife ecologist and the host of the podcast, The Wild. And I'm very excited because we're going to be playing some of our favorite episodes of the podcast on air here on KUOW. The team's been calling it The Wild on Air. It's got a pretty good ring to it, doesn't it? And today is the first of them. The Wild is all about wild animals and places. And we dive into ecology and conservation But honestly, a lot of it comes down to the human heart, the human condition, and our place on this planet. We've been to a lot of really incredible places around the world to bring you these stories from the high Arctic of Norway, an episode about polar bears, that one was, to the tropical rainforest of Belize and their scarlet macaws and jaguars, to wolves coming back to Germany. And of course, We've told a lot of stories about the Pacific Northwest, too, home of KUOW, after all, and my home, too, for 25 years. I live up in Bellingham. The Pacific Northwest is a place I'm really passionate about, partly because it's home to so much wildlife. I feel very lucky to live here. So we're kicking off this archival journey with something topical for this time of year. No, It's not pumpkins. The team decided it would be good to start with bears. And honestly, that's fine by me because I'm a bit obsessed by them. You'll hear more in the story coming up. A little spoiler alert, when I was 18 years old, I was kind of destined to become a graphic designer. I didn't become a graphic designer (laughs) because I started working with bears instead. Of course, totally logical. So... For the last 35 years, they've been my focus. Research projects, education work with communities in different parts of the world, hosting nature documentaries, and of course, podcasts. So why this time of year for bears? Well, because in the fall, they enter a state called hyperphagia, which literally means excessive eating, hyperphagia. They basically become insatiably hungry. I do this every time I'm on vacation. I come back a few pounds heavier. But bears do it almost by clockwork as they fatten up every fall, getting ready to sleep off the winter, nice and rotund. For them, the fatter the better. And when 80 or 90% of what you eat is plants and insects, it's a pretty much a full-time job gaining weight that will allow you to sleep for six months. Maybe you've heard of Fat Bear Week. That's this week for a good reason. You may have no idea what I'm talking about. Just look up Fat Bear Week and you'll see. Um, My money, by the way, is on Bear 747, also known as Coal Bear. (laughs) Bears are also in the headlines this week. There was the news of the grizzly bear attack in Banff, a tragedy where two people were killed. Even though this is very rare, it's a reminder that encounters with wildlife can be very serious. And here in Washington... The government last week released the draft environmental impact statement that looks at how grizzly bears might be restored here in the North Cascades. Much more on that later this hour. So this first story is called The First Time I Caught a Grizzly Bear. And it's about, well, it's about the first time I caught a grizzly bear, which was 29 years ago now, hard to believe. Um, I told Jim, our editor, and Matt, our producer, this story, kind of like filling them in on my background when we were first starting The Wild. And they said, wait, we need to record this. So we did. And it became one of our very first episodes in season one back in 2019. I hope you enjoy it. It's uh, kind of a bit like an introduction to me and my work. The first time I caught a grizzly was 25 years ago. As you'd suspect, it's rather difficult 
You see, I've been obsessed with bears since August 23rd, 1987, the day I chased a tranquilized black bear through a garbage dump in New Hampshire. I was working with a biologist who was studying the bears in the area. I was 18. The date sticks with me. I think about it all the time because before that day, before that surreal and unexpected experience, I was all set to become a graphic designer. College plans, the whole lot. But that bear changed something inside me and, and totally shifted my whole perspective on what I was here to do. Catching a black bear was one thing, but I came to realise that this was just the beginning, the training ground for the things to come. Catching a grizzly bear? Oh boy, that was something else altogether. It's 1994 in the Canadian Rockies and I'm a nervous 24-year-old, standing between two well-armed men. It's like a scene from a heist movie. We're here to catch a grizzly bear. A few grizzly bears, if possible. It immediately sounds crazy that there's a job like this to catch grizzly bears, but I was with a man who had that job, Ian Ross, a wildlife biologist who'd become legendary in the bear world for his almost innate ability to catch grizzly bears for scientific research. He was working on the Eastern Slopes Grizzly Bear Project, and this was a cutting-edge effort to understand how grizzlies can survive in what's quickly becoming a human-dominated region. Tracking them, collecting their DNA, learning from the bears, and here I was, I was with Ian on his team. I'd landed a job, like my dream job, and I was about to learn from the master. Ian was about the most stoic guy you could imagine. Calm, mild-mannered, and in control of his every movement and emotion. Kind of like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti western. Very chilled, but with this glint in his eye and a dry wit you could never see coming. First time we met was at a firing range, part of an official safety training course before going into action. And I was a bit wet behind the ears. I, I think Ian felt like he'd got the short straw. I was this exuberant young Brit who was probably more of a liability than an asset. I remember him looking at me curiously, like he was examining some kind of strange animal. Are you ready for this, Chris? He asked. And he told me that catching a grizzly is basically weeks of tedium interspersed with moments of absolute terror. I was totally ready. <laughs> The only way to really understand grizzly bears, especially back then, 25 years ago, was to follow them and learn about their lives. But, but how to do that was the dilemma. They can have home ranges that are hundreds of square miles in size in some really wild country. Radio collars were the answer, and getting a radio collar on a bear was something I was here to master by learning from the master. On the first day, Ian, a conservation officer named Dave, and I headed out in the pickup truck. Uh, the smell of the truck was the first thing that hit me. It was just rank, almost overwhelming. And the task was to find a good place to set our capture gear somewhere a grizzly bear might pass through. I remember as we jumped off the truck, Ian handed me a rope and he told me to hold on tight. And he pulled the truck away and the ropes unraveling in my hand. And when the rope got tight, a dead beaver slopped out of the back of the pickup truck onto the ground. Like, I could see Ian smiling in his rearview mirror. This was our bait. And I felt a bit like bait too. I was the gullible Englishman who had to drag the beaver carcass up the hill to create a scent trail. A great plan, because a grizzly bear sees the world through his nose. Their sense of smell is about ten times better than a bloodhound. So the first thing to do is create a scent trail with a stinky beaver carcass right up to the door of our cubby. Now, the cubby is where it all happens. It's basically a bunch of logs all piled together in a triangle shape for the grizzly bear to walk into. About four feet wide at the entrance, at the doorway, this entrance you place a foot snare. A humane system, it doesn't hurt the bear. It's, it's a quarter-inch aircraft cable that you attach to the anchor tree at the entrance, and then the other end creates a loop for the bear to step into. 
The snare cables then attach to a metal foot treadle and a big spring the size of your forearm. And when the bear steps onto the treadle, it releases the spring and throws the cable up onto the forearm of the bear, hopefully attaching him to the anchor tree for us to then come in and tranquilize and put on a radio collar. And the beaver carcass? We strap that to a tree at the back of the cubby. If anything brings in a hungry grizzly, it's a stinky dead beaver. Setting a snare is more of an art than a science, and it's where I started to learn how to really think like a bear. You have to lay moss on the snare to hide it, and then you push small, sharp twigs into the ground to guide the bear's paw into just the right 12-inch hole where he'll step into the snare. The last thing we did at every site was shove a branch in the ground with a, a bit of orange flagging tape on the end of it, about six feet high. So if a bear did walk in and ended up being snared, he'd knock his flagpole down, which would then let us know from a safe distance if we'd got a bear or not. After we set the trap up, we left. I was so excited to see if this would really work, to see if we really could catch a grizzly. The next day we came back. No bear. We came back the next day, and the day after that, still no bear. This is where the weeks of tedium begin. Every day we headed out on quads or in the truck to check the capture sites, and we had about six of them set in different areas of the forest. And every day we'd go through the same routine. You know, I'd have Ian on one side and Dave on the other, one with a shotgun and one with a rifle, just in case. And we all had bare pepper sprays on our belts. And it was my job to check with binoculars to see if that flagpole was still up. Yep, flagpole, up, no bear. And then we'd move in on foot to check the traps to see if anything had been poking around. Or if the snare had been tripped and needed resetting. And it was tense. It was always tense. A grizzly can run 35 miles per hour and that's as fast as a racehorse. And they don't like being approached or cornered. So we walk into this one site, same as every other single day. The ribbon flagpole is up and the stick is still in the ground. Check with my binoculars. Nope, no grizzly bear. So we walk up, kind of casually, but still looking carefully as we approach, though. I'm, and I'm thinking, what would be different today to the previous three weeks, you know? We get to within 20 feet of the cubby. And boom! Suddenly... Out of nowhere, this bear just barrels out of a hole in the ground and it right at us, like in a nanosecond. Talk about life flashing before your eyes. This is it. It's all over, I thought, you know. This guy's covered in mud and I'm reaching for my bear spray and I can't grab it. And we all take a step back like we were shoved in the chest. And right then, the bear rolls it, like into a somersault. He's been tugged back by the cable. He's attached. Thank God. So now I'm reaching for my binoculars because I need a close-up of his wrist to, to make sure that the cable is on there and not just on his toes. Because if it's on his toes, he could break free and be on us. I'm shaking like a leaf, trying to hold my binoculars to my eyes to see if he's got this snare around his wrist. And as I do, the bear backs up to give himself some room. And he reaches the end of the cable and then comes barreling at us again. He's huffing and charging, and he does it over and over again, like at super speed. Every time he's tugged back by the cable around his forearm and charging at us, he's pissed. My heart, you know, my heart rate's through the roof. I mean, it is now just telling this story. And then I see the cable, and it is, it's on his wrist, it's secure. And I'm, I look over at Ian, I'm panting at this point, and Ian just looks at me calmly and says, sure beats a cup of coffee. And I'm like, I just my pants. It's like weeks of tedium interspersed with moments of absolute terror. I was a wreck, but I had never felt so alive in my life. We backed away. We were all pretty wound up and, and we didn't want to stress the bear. And so Ian darted the bear with a tranquilizer rifle. And five minutes later, it was the most tranquil scene. And I had my hands on a live Rocky Mountain grizzly bear. He was covered in mud but I could see he had a beautiful thick coat and his giant paws. I just remember these huge paws with long white claws and looking down into the big hole he'd dug in the ground, like he'd been hiding from us in it. I could just picture him wiping camo onto his face, waiting for us to arrive. We were with him as he slept for an hour. 
What a life this grizzly bear was leading. Every day, out in the wild, like, like something from the ancient past. Out doing his thing every day. We put the radio collar on the bear. Give him a shot of antibiotic. Take some DNA blood samples and I monitor the rectal temperature. Another job for the new guy, of course. <laughs> and then we weigh him. We hoist him up off the ground over a small log. 350 pounds. A good sized bear. And he's in great health. Then we remove the cable, get him all comfortable, and leave him alone to wake up quietly. We named him Dawson, after the small creek nearby. Dawson the grizzly bear. I had no idea what he would mean to me in, in the years to come. For the next two seasons, I tracked Dawson and a dozen or so other grizzly bears through the Canadian Rockies on foot, following the signals from the radio collars, like breadcrumbs into another world teaching us where they go, what they eat, where they mate, and, and what they need to survive. I hiked 2,000 miles over those two years. They were two of the best years of my life. Dawson and other bears taught me a lot. It was a window into the wild, and I was in total awe. Experiences like that, I think, are where some solid buddies emerge. Ian and I had become great friends. He even met my parents. I remember one evening them um, totally wide-eyed around a campfire in grizzly bear country, listening to him recite The Cremation of Sam McGee, the ten-minute poem by Robert Service. I went on to work on other projects in different parts of the world and in every place using what Dawson had taught me, and Ian too. Then one day, about eight years later, Ian calls me up, he was on another project in the Rockies where he needed to capture more grizzlies. He wanted me to be on the team. So, of course, I jumped all over the chance to work with Ian again. The band was back together. So out we went, you know the score, weeks of tedium interspersed with moments of absolute terror. Every day, shoulder to shoulder, flag pulled up, no bear, until this one day. We walked into the trap site and everything was quiet, got closer and closer, when suddenly... This giant bear leaps out of a hole, all covered in mud, and charges at us, somersaults over. I mean, he's huge, bigger than any bear I'd seen at that point. I look over at Ian, who's almost as surprised as I am at this, this point, and he smiles and just says, Sure beats a cup of coffee. We tranquilized the bear, put a collar on him, weighed him 650 pounds. Enormous for a bear in this part of the world, and such an amazing thing to see up close, a grizzly that big. We finished up and left him in peace, and I honestly didn't think much more about it. A month later, back at home, and I get a call from Ian. You know the big old bear we caught? Yeah. Ian tells me they ran the DNA, and you'll never guess who it was. Dawson. I was blown away. It was Dawson, eight years later, and he was almost double the weight. The first time we caught him, he was 350 pounds, and the second time, 650 pounds. Dawson was alive. He was like the king of the hill. He'd managed to get across the highways and the railroads and avoid trouble on the golf courses and get around this busy world of humans. And not only that, he was still teaching us what it takes to be a grizzly. He became an amazing grizzly bear success story to me. A year after we caught Dawson for the second time, I got a call that was one of the toughest I've ever received. Ian had been killed in a plane crash. He was tracking lions in Africa and it hit me hard. I'd, I'd heard from him just days before, loving life and living to understand the animals he loved. And right away I thought of Dawson. I'm so grateful that Dawson brought me to Ian and that Ian brought me to Dawson for those incredible experiences together. I think about them both almost every day and how they both shaped everything I do. And I know that somewhere in those rocky mountains are Dawson's descendants roaming their wilderness thanks to the people like Ian who set out to save them.
Well, it um, it brings back so many memories hearing that story again. Ian was a, a really formative part of my life working on bears and in conservation. I had uh, so much respect for him. And I've met so many inspiring people working on wildlife all over the world since Ian. And it's kind of become the basis for our podcast, focusing on those people as much as the wildlife and the ecology. I've worked on projects on lots of different species, but for me, it always comes back to bears. I'm always looking for a moment to talk about them. Now, why is that? Well, you know, when I was young, like working on the bear capture team in the Canadian Rockies, it all felt like a big adventure, working with massive carnivores, for goodness sake. But I quickly started to realize, I was working all over the world in my my 20s and in my 30s, that that these bears represent big wild spaces, the big wild spaces we all need. Bears are like umbrellas for protecting those places and biodiversity, nature, our life support system, our source of food, water, shelter, defense against climate change. A few years ago, I did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. There are eight bear species in the world. So if you put all of those eight bear species together, if you sort of combined their distribution across the planet, you'd find that they cover around one-third of the Earth's land surface. So, So these icons, the bears of the world, can help us identify and protect what's left of our wild planet. I had a really proud moment a couple of years ago uh, when I was describing this. I was a guest on Bill Nye's show, and this concept of protecting the planet by protecting the bears blew his mind. It was awesome. (laughs) Um, I tried to carry the torch, too, to inspire the next generation like Ian and other people did for me. I mentor a group of young emerging conservationists who most definitely teach me as much as I teach them We also have a school curriculum based on the wild podcast, free to teachers everywhere. I take people on trips into the wild. These are all geared towards inspiring people about this incredible planet we live on. I like to to picture a world where care for our planet comes naturally and is a normal part of life. So this next episode, sitting by a campfire in the North Cascades near my home, is all about one of the most mysterious of bears, the North Cascades grizzly bear. They've lived here for thousands of years, coexisting with indigenous peoples. But for the last few decades, they've been on a bit of a roller coaster ride as humans basically decide their fate. It's a pretty fascinating ride. I'll check in with you at the end for an update on the news this week about the next step for these North Cascades bears. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Oh, I love a nice fire, especially in a place like this on a wet day. When I was 18, uh, something happened to me that changed the course of my life. I'd landed a job on a summer camp in the woods of New Hampshire, near a little town called Berlin. And kids were there to learn about wildlife and bushcraft and sustainable hunting. And I was, I was supposed to teach them fishing. I was only 18 myself, but I loved nature. And the summer camp had loads of weird and wonderful guests come through to talk to the kids. And one day this this guy walks in to talk about his work and he has armfuls of show and tell stuff, you know, skulls and hides and plastic ass tracks. And and he was a black bear biologist. And I'm thinking, you can be a bear biologist? I'd never given a thought to bears at that point, but I wanted to know what this guy did. So I asked him if I could go out into the field with him. He didn't bite. Last thing he needed, I think, was a crazy young English fella getting in the way. But finally, about two weeks later, the bear biologist calls me up one evening and tells me it's time. Time to see a bear. So one evening, 
the bear biologist picks me up at the camp and we pull out of the front gate but in, instead of taking a left into the forest he takes a right towards town and I'm like aren't we supposed to go the other way but we weren't going to the woods we were headed to his research site he pulls up to the city dump I can't believe what I see. It's nine o'clock at night when we get to the dump and as my eyes adjust, I see 14 black bears all rummaging through the garbage pile searching for food, all romantically lit by moonlight. We spent half the night tranquilizing and collaring them so that he could follow them for his research study. After that night, over 30 years ago, in the city dump, I knew what my life would be. I told myself, I'm going to study bears. And not just any bears. That night eventually led me to search out for one really special bear. The ghost bears of the North Cascades in Washington State. I'm in those mountains now to tell the story. The story of those bears. One day in 1967, a man left his cabin and hiked deep into the mountains here in Washington State and shot a bear, a grizzly bear. It was the last legal kill here, and it turns out one of the last remaining grizzly bears. Ironically, just one year later in 1968, the valley became part of of the brand new North Cascades National Park. I was born in November of that same year, a million miles from the Pacific Northwest. At one time, there used to be hundreds of grizzly bears here in the North Cascades, but when European settlers got here, the bears were hunted almost to extinction. There weren't any match for muskets and rifles, and they stood in the way of progress, otherwise known as our Western expansion. It's pretty hard to fathom. 200 years ago, there were at least 50,000 grizzlies in the lower 48, maybe even 100,000, and now there are fewer than 2,000. So during that 200 years, grizzlies in the lower 48 were pushed into five areas, five ecosystems, wild mountains and valleys, places that were too wild for human settlement, away from human populations, places like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park and the Cascades where I'm sitting right now. It's a big place. The ecosystem for bears here is about 10,000 square miles in size. It's lots of big mountains and rivers and huge forests. But Here, there are fewer than 20 grizzlies, probably less, maybe just one or two. We don't know for sure. There's definitely this air of mystery around them, and it's it's why people call them ghost bears. And it's what pulls me in. After my first experience with, with the bears in that dump in New Hampshire, I went back to England and I studied conservation. I ended up getting an advanced degree in ecology, but in Britain, the the only bears you find in Britain are in zoos. They went extinct there about a thousand years ago, so I did my research project on endangered red squirrels, like like a bear study in miniature. But that's a whole other story for another campfire. So to study bears, I had to get creative. So I traveled around the world, volunteering on research projects and then even getting paid a little bit. It was really exciting and and I was gathering all this knowledge along the way. I went to Pakistan and Spain to study brown bears and Ecuador for spectacle bears. Went to the Canadian Rockies and the Arctic. But grizzlies, those were the bears that grabbed me. (laughs) Not literally, of course. Touch, Touch wood. So when I left England in 1997 and moved to the Pacific Northwest, I immediately felt this connection to the North Cascades. Grizzlies have lived in these mountains for about 20,000 years. They've evolved alongside wolves and eagles and salmon, and they've coexisted with Native American people here for thousands of years. One thing that really fascinates me about grizzlies is their relationship to their ecosystem. They're omnivores, so they eat all kinds of things, a bit like us. And meat is actually less than 20% of their diet. Plants are their main thing. And here in the Cascades, there are about 100 plant species on their menu. Everything from devil's club berries to glacier lily bulbs. I can see five different bear foods from where I'm sitting. Grizzlies are like these four-wheel drive gardeners you know they till up the soil with those big claws looking for roots and insects it's it's amazing to watch they're such resourceful animals in yellowstone they even eat moths thousands of them a day they'll find them under rocks and and they're a really good source of fat 
And grizzlies, as we all know, they all they love berries. They'll scarf down a hundred thousand berries in a single day. I've watched them delicately pluck them off bushes with those big lips. And all those berry seeds have to come out the other end at some point. <laughs> you know, perhaps miles from where they were eaten. And this brings me to another of my favourite things about bears. Their scat. Poop. I'm fascinated by it because you can learn so much from the stuff. Their scat is so full of clues about what they've been eating and where they've been. You'll never see me walking past a pile of it. And it makes bears really important seed dispersers, planting things that benefit all kinds of other species too, especially insects and birds. And in Alaska, I've, I've watched bears eat a lot of salmon. I watched this one big male eat 15 sockeye salmon in less than an hour. And then he heads back into the forest and fertilizes the forest with scat and urine. You know, lots of lovely nitrogen. Fish fertilizer. They're like the middlemen between the salmon and the trees. It's amazing. There's a lot going on in the bear's world. So what do they need? What are these handful of bears in the North Cascades need to survive. Well, in 1975, the government put grizzly bears on the endangered species list. And since then, they've made a pretty good return in and around Yellowstone. People see them there all the time. It blows me away when I do, seeing lower 48 grizzlies. Their numbers in and around Yellowstone have grown since the 70s by about 400%. So there's about 700 of them there in that ecosystem. And that's great news in heading in the right direction. But here in the Cascades, we haven't been so lucky. They've been hammered so hard historically that they haven't bounced back. One problem is that grizzlies reproduce really slowly. They're actually the second slowest reproducing mammal in North America. Grizzlies only have a couple of cubs on average every three or four years, and then half of them don't survive past their first year. These cubs, and it's incredible, they only weigh about one pound when they're born. About the same as a squirrel. Amazing to think that they can grow up to weigh more than five or six hundred pounds. But it's a struggle for them to survive. And, you know, they don't just bounce back in numbers. So when I moved to the Pacific Northwest 20 plus years ago in, in the late 90s as a, a young ecologist, something, something kind of called me. I was young, I was broke, I was a new dad, but I wanted to save the grizzlies. I wanted to bring them back to the North Cascades. I just had to figure out how. It sounds a bit grandiose when I say it now, but I like a challenge. And I knew bears very well by this point. I'd followed in their footsteps for 2,000 miles around the Rockies for one thing. But what I wasn't ready for was, was the other stuff. So this episode was released in 2019 in the middle of Donald Trump's presidency. His administration looks like they were going to continue the process for bears. Then they cancelled the whole program. That's the thing with grizzly bear conservation. Things seem to change every four years. And they've just changed again. Stay tuned and I'll give you a very fresh update about North Cascades grizzly bears after this next part of the story. I learned here early on that grizzlies in the Cascades are up against two things. And it's not biology or ecology. It's politics and perceptions. With perception... I think it's, it's hard to understand what you can't see. No one sees these bears. Remember the, the ghost bear and all? And if you can't see something, it's easy to fear it. The chances of actually seeing a grizzly here are, are really low. I've spent years looking for them in the North Cascades. Sometimes I feel like I've looked behind every tree, but I've never even seen a track. And very occasionally you hear about a possible grizzly sighting and people go nuts. You know, any news of a sighting is a big deal. One story sticks with me. Uh, a man was alone on a hike on a high ridge up by Cascade Pass in the National Park, and he saw this enormous bear silhouetted up on the ridge about 80 yards away from him. He hadn't seen him, so he grabbed his point-and-shoot camera and he took some photos because there was something different about this bear. It had a huge shoulder hump like grizzlies do. So he came down from his hike and a few friends told him to submit them to the government agencies, which he did. They were amazing. These five photographs, this big silhouette with a, 
unmistakable grizzly bear hump, and he said the bear was brown in colour. When the photographs reached me, they literally like made my heart race. I, I stared at them for hours. My God, it's a North Cascades grizzly bear. A dozen or maybe more grizzly bear experts weighed in on a blind test. Yep, that is 100% a North Cascades grizzly bear. So it was celebrated. It was an official confirmed sighting. The first one since 1996, 14 years earlier. Then something really unusual happened. I get an email out of the blue from a photographer. He's also seen and photographed this huge bear in the same place two days before the other guy. And he saw this excitement and this hullabaloo online about the confirmed grizzly bear sighting, but he wanted me to see some other photographs that he had taken, and they told a different story. I remember like, opening up the photographs on my laptop, and the first thing I see is this enormous shoulder hump. But it wasn't to be. It was a black bear. Just about the biggest black bear I've ever seen. And with this grizzly bear-like hump that was enough to throw a panel of experts off completely. The official report had to be changed. There was now way too much doubt around the sighting. No one really knew if these two men had photographed the same bear, but it couldn't be considered the grizzly sighting we had all been waiting for. We won't ever know for sure. So I'm thinking the first thing I need to do to save the grizzlies in the Cascades is to share what I know about them, you know, to make people more familiar and and fascinated by them and in the process reduce the fear and, and change the perception, really. To do that, I created an outreach project. I didn't have much money, so to save on gas, I bought a motorcycle and I rode that motorbike all over the Pacific Northwest. It's a dual sport BMW. It's great for on, on and off road and to get into those wild places. And I was an unusual sight. An Englishman on a bike talking about grizzly bears. It's, it certainly got me noticed. People opened up and asked me questions and it created this connection that allowed me to talk about grizzlies and their importance to the Cascades. I spoke at schools and public meetings and I took people on treks into bear country. It was an exciting time and felt like progress. Then in 2014, things picked up in a big way. This is where the politics part comes in. The federal government announced a plan that would potentially involve bringing grizzlies into the North Cascades to help them come back. This idea of capturing bears in a place with good grizzly numbers, like the Montana Rockies, and then bringing them to Washington. An environmental impact statement was started to figure out if if that should happen. Although it was a long shot, it was a huge step forward on this road to bringing grizzlies back to the Cascades. I was thrilled. But there were a lot of people who weren't so happy about this idea. Some people got pretty upset over it. One time I was in a small town in the mountains and I went into this office to ask for directions for a meeting I was going to. And this guy is sitting at his desk and kind of looks me up and down like he's curious about why I'm talking about grizzly bears. He jumps to his feet and I'm like, oh, nice guy, he's going to give me directions. He walks right past me and, and straight out the front door and grabs something from the door of his truck and then walks right up to me in the doorway of his office. He leans in, and he presses a revolver in my stomach, and and whispers, You come here again talking about grizzly bears, and you might not leave. I froze. This was a first for me, and it was intense, as you can imagine. The blood totally drained from my head, and, and this mix of fear and anger just flooded over me it was a i don't know just a really real reminder that not everyone loves these bears but then something even more surprising happened we did this awkward kind of two-step in the doorway and i remember holding my hands up and saying something like hey you know that's not cool let's talk i ended up sitting with this guy for over an hour talking to him like a freudian shrink turns out that This was more about the government he didn't want in his life than grizzlies. Not everyone gets that intense, but I've I've come across others who feel the same way, people who have real concerns about grizzlies coming back. 
the local economy has been struggling for years when the lumber industry all but collapsed. Loggers think the endangered grizzlies will bring with them more government regulations and make their jobs even more difficult. And ranchers are worried that bears will prey on their livestock. I've spoken to so many of these folks and I, I get their fears, especially when it's their livelihoods we're talking about. But myths and legends have not been kind to grizzlies. And I've met other ranchers, ones living deep in grizzly country in Montana, a place with a lot more grizzlies than here. And the ranchers there said that they coexist just fine with grizzlies. One, one of them said to me that they have more calves killed by rattlesnakes and even lightning strikes than grizzly bears. And another rancher even told me he'd, he'd sometimes walk out of his door in the morning and there would be a big old male grizzly with his head in the feeding trough right next to his cows. The majority of the people I've spoken to on my travels say that they want the grizzly to come back to the Cascades. We even hired a company to do a poll and and they found really strong support. Most people think grizzlies are a part of our natural heritage for future generations here. But that still doesn't change the fact that there are still people who hate the idea. It's tough. A couple of years ago I got an email out of the blue from a, a local second grade teacher. He told me He had my biggest fan in his class and that this kid was obsessed with bears and me and my films and that he he checked my book out of the library every week for the last six months. The kid's name is Roman and he's eight years old. Oh, my heart melted. It reminded me we were doing good things. We were getting word out and people cared. And the government process had now included over 120,000 comments from the public showing broad support, but still... When it comes to bear politics, nothing happens fast. Then, one day last year, I get a call from a colleague telling me a a very high-up politician was coming to town to talk about grizzlies, to make some kind of special announcement. It was the Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke. And, you know, imagine this was a big deal because the federal government had been getting closer to making a decision about whether or not they'd start relocating grizzlies. Zinke was a new appointment under the Trump administration. It was all over, I thought. Decades spent talking to people, raising awareness, listening to concerns, riding that motorcycle all over the Pacific Northwest, all in an attempt to return grizzlies to the Cascades, and trying to do it in a fair way with local people and thousands of conversations, all that work for nothing. So I go to the meeting and the room's full of people. There were about 30 or so of us in there, all talking in this tense whisper. There's press and TV cameras, and we're all wondering how this is going to go down. And then Zinke strides in, and he clasps his hands around the podium, and he looks at us like he's ready to spring a surprise, and with a big smile across his face, he says, "Uh, Don't look so worried. I grew up on the flanks of Glacier National Park, and I'm in support of the Great Bear. When done right, the grizzly can return harmony back to the ecosystem. And I'm here to accelerate this process. The room was silent. Stunned was the word. I mean, this is not what we expected to hear. The guy loves grizzlies. This is going to happen. My colleagues and I drank that night. But you know when some things just seem too good to be true... Well, just a few months passed, and in August, same year, 2018, there's an about turn. Zinke suddenly puts a hold on all North Cascades grizzly bear recovery work, and just like that, it was off. Some political manoeuvring behind the scenes that I'll I'll never really understand. And several months later, Zinke was gone. He resigns during some ethics investigations. I'm thinking, I've seen it all. Not sure how many twists there can be in the North Cascades grizzly bear saga. And now, the future of these bears in the North Cascades is as uncertain as ever. I honestly don't know what will come next. So I've gotten back on my motorcycle. I'm back on my journey to inspire people about grizzlies and to try and change perceptions. Hoping that the people in power, the politicians, will act. And I like to think they'll do the right thing find a way forward that works not just for bears but for humans too. Bringing grizzlies to the Cascades could honestly become a success story for the world to see and learn from. 
you know, here in Washington State, we're a proud bunch when it comes to the place we live. These amazing mountains, huge trees and forests, rivers, eagles, salmon, orcas, and somewhere a handful of grizzly bears surviving against the odds, representing what's left of the Wild West that so many people love. Their future is 100% in our hands. And then there's Roman. Remember the eight-year-old whose teacher called him my biggest fan? I decided to pay him a surprise visit in his classroom. His teacher and I plotted to wait until recess, and then I came in and I sat on his tiny chair waiting for him to come back. I brought bear pictures, skulls, hides, teeth, and a copy of my book for him so he doesn't have to check it out anymore. I'll never forget his face as he walked in. He said nothing the whole hour. He just had this big, shy, wide grin across his face as his classmates raced around us. And I'm, I'm looking at Roman thinking, hmm, there's a kid. You could end up in the garbage dump too, for all the right reasons. Oh, Roman, I'll never forget that kid's face, the, the, the little bear advocate that he is. So here's the latest. As of just over a week ago, uh, the plan is back on. The National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released a draft plan to restore grizzly bears to the North Cascades ecosystem. And the Biden administration has invited public comments like they do during these releases of these plans. Uh, They want to know how people feel when it comes to slowly restoring the population of grizzly bears here in the North Cascades. And, And as you've heard, people's perspectives are very nuanced. I think that's natural with something as complicated as this issue, as this topic of grizzly bears and humans. Most people surveyed over the decades want the bears back, but there's definitely some pretty vocal opposition too. I've been on the front line of some of it. How do you feel about grizzly bears coming back to the North Cascades? The public comment period uh, that the government has open right now is open till November 13th. The website for it, if you'd like to share your opinion, is uh, www.parkplanning.nps.gov. We would also love to hear from you here at The Wild about your relationship with bears or how you feel about North Cascades grizzly bear restoration or any questions you might have, send us an email at thewild at kow.org. I really hope you've enjoyed our first radio broadcast of The Wild. These stories are very personal experiences for me and I'm, I'm humbled to share them with you and I'm grateful to the bears working Working with them and tracking them all over the world has made me kind of look at the world differently. Look at life differently, really. Looking for tiny berries on the trail, you know, that might have fallen from a bear's mouth or a a single brown hair on a tree left by a bear passing through has made me pretty observant. I also look at the world through a bear's eyes when I'm in bear country and it really brings the place alive. And maybe their most important role, I think, is that bears keep us humble. And it's that humility and compassion and empathy that'll hopefully see us through into a new chapter for the the tricky relationship between humans and nature. We'll be back with The Wild on air next week, so I hope you can tune in. We've got a great show from the archives about staying safe in the wild. Not just bears, but cougars and other critters too, including a gorilla encounter in Uganda. The silverback is just behind you. He sat sat a meter behind you, and there are three babies squashed between him and you. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Matt Martin and Lucy Suchek. Jim Gates is our editor. This broadcast version is produced by Brandy Fullwood. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Bob Yellilis, Barbara Stolman, Julian John Hansen, and Annie Mize. Our production team includes Paul Bikis, Juan Pablo Giquiza, 
April Craig, Michaela Ginotti Boyle, Tatiana Latre, Cara McDermott, Darcy Regan Schmidt, and Brandon Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan, which I've already told you. Take care of yourselves and do what you can to take care of our planet. We are all very much in this together. 